Hi, everyone. Carmen Denisco here on the Launch Network. We've got some awesome shows. We've been bringing some awesome guests, giving you some great information, hopefully helping out in the long term. I got the man of the hour, my co-host for Made in America, Mr. Christopher Guerrero. Chris, what's happening, my friend? Carmine, doing pretty good. I'm really excited about being in Florida with you in the next couple of weeks and doing these live in the Sunshine State. Dude, it's awesome. I mean, of course, you wait till winter is over after spring. I mean, but that's fine with me. It's all cool, dude. It's always warm here. I know. I know. <laughs> we know we're getting some pretty good weather in Carolina now. It's awesome. I, the that's difference great. from the Northeast for me has always been like you truly get spring again, right, in the, in the South. You have a spring, you have a fall. It's not like you go from winter to on and off hot and cold days to the yeah. summer. Yeah. You, you truly do get spring again, which I, I have. Yeah. Absolutely love. Yeah, here's a, you know, it's cold. Well, when I say cold, 50 degrees cold here. And then all of a sudden it's 90. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. I know. And, you know, the other thing too, uh, Carmine, I think the UIA board really doing some pretty fun stuff now. Really excited part of that with the new ambassadors we're adding and a whole new plan really of action to get some good, uh, some, some good subscriptions and get folks following some really good advice and free, uh, information that can help them launch yeah it's really testing my organizational abilities i must say but yeah they're doing a great job we got some great people on board and we're bringing on some awesome stuff but let's talk about our guests coming on today man i've been thinking about this all day yesterday it's going to be an awesome yes. show there it is this is this is uh not just a let's say a great toy or a, it's like a genius the development and design right my man Jim malone the, the bunch of balloons inventor. This thing has got such a story that has to be heard by anybody inventing, right? And I just look at this and I look at the iteration. So today I figured we'd get Josh on, talk about how he developed it, the manufacturing techniques, how he marketed it, the price structure. And then what happened? That's the real key is as this started to sell, and this is, I'm telling you, it's a genius, incredible idea what happened after it started to sell and that's that's the cricket today's uh t today's story but let, let's bring josh on and introduce him and uh let's start talking about what a what a what a great great design and, and product and how it was all developed welcome josh thanks good to be here yeah so so josh let's start with um you know i i, I think about my filling up balloons <laughs> man where was this right one at a time, you know, but by the time you're done filling up 10, you had enough, you're throwing them, you want to make sure when you hit somebody, you're really putting it to work. Now you do 100 at a time? Oh my goodness, please, where was this? Yeah, why didn't you think of that, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, this is a good one. And when I show so some of my friends who don't even know that it's actually on the market, they look at it and go, oh my God, so yeah, think about having a having you know a hot summer day and you're you're doing your slides down the hill. You got balloon fights. Think about how many balloons you can make. And what what, what is it? So tell tell us a little bit about it. Tell us how you developed it. You know, it's a hundred balloons. What do you do it in a minute? I don't know. Tell us all about it. Well, uh, let me back up a little bit and, and tell you how I got here. Okay. Uh, so I've got some graphics for you guys. Great. I uh, so I was in high tech. I think. Maybe Chris, you you and I have a little bit of commonality there. Uh, yes, I was uh, I was at Texas Instruments. I was a, a process engineer working on high tech stuff. Um, I was in the DLP division, so we were making uh, micro mirror displays. So we would create an image um, uh, made out of millions of uh, actually moving pixels. So the LCD technology was you know solid state. We actually had uh, all these mo moving devices. Um, so it was really fascinating technology. And uh, I, I learned a lot. I had some inventions there. Um, but as the company grew and the organization grew, I felt stifled and I wanted to go out on my own and pursue some, some ideas I had to launch products. Um, so I left and strapped on my parachute and jumped out of the plane and became an entrepreneur. Uh, one of my first inventions was a digital paper cutter. Um, I wanted to find a way 
It's, and so for, for inventors, you know, it's, it's uh, usually it, it, there's a problem, right? And, and so in my case, I, I was aware that they were using the, my wife and her mom and friends and uh, people were using these machines for cutting shapes and, and letters out of paper and cardstock for card making and scrapbooking, stuff like that. Well, they were using industrial tools, basically. So they would use a steel rule die and and it would go in this machine, you would crunch out the shape out of paper. Um, and so if you wanted an alphabet, they had 26 of these dies and lowercase is another 26 and punctuation. And that's just for one font and one size. And before you know it, they had these uh, suitcases and closets full of what, what to me was industrial equipment. And it just struck me that that's not the right solution. And uh, I know, you know, I know you have a manufacturing background, but to me, this was not a uh, this was not a place for uh, parallel processing, right? Where and that's what a, a die punch is. You're you're cutting the shape out all at once. To me, I'm thinking you only want one a lot of times. You don't want to make you know many many copies of one thing. You want to make one. And so I I looked at a person from a serial standpoint. Can we just draw the shape? We only want one of them. And so I took the technology basically for a vinyl sign cutter and I shrunk it down and came up with a novel mechanism to fit everything there and put a, you know, put a battery pack and digital interface. And so that was my first adventure. And uh, it was interesting. The product design and development part was challenging. Um, but what surprised me was the, the marketing and distribution and licensing was, was way harder than, than the design. Right. Um, so I spent like six months getting it built and prototype and I went to a trade show and it was hugely popular. And, and then, we just kind of things ground to a halt. It took over a year to, to put together a licensing deal and bring it to market. Um, but it, that was somewhat successful. It was enough to keep me going. Then I had a product, uh, a toy product that was just a total flop. Lost lots of money, but hey, I was one for two. That's pretty good as, a, as an inventor. <laughs> you mean you mean like uh, you just didn't you just didn't launch a product and make a million dollars in uh, in six months? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> this was so this was that's the myth. I'm showing here from 2006 to 2013 it was a seven year journey yep. and we had kind of it was kind of break even you know I wasn't really getting ahead financially but I had this amazing experience but my wife was like hey we we got to send the kids to college they need their teeth straightened you have to go back and get a regular job um, so <laughs> I'm like no I can't I was yeah. dreading it and so <laughs> And so I went back to uh, trying to tackle this this water balloon problem. So, I, so the water balloon, from what I understand, was invented in 1950, and uh, for 63 years we, we were filling them one at a time and tying them with a knot. And you know, as a kid, I you know it was tedious and it didn't you know it was it was more pain than than fun. And then I was a grown up and I was too old to play with water balloons, I guess. But then I had my own kids, so I was back in the game. And by then I had, uh, I, was, I was spending hours and tying thousands of water balloons and that's when it hit me, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And so after many, over many summers, I would think about it and I would start to tinker and um, it hit me. Uh, I don't know if you probably recognize this feeling, but to, to me, you just see that there has to be a solution to this. And I, I, I learned after that more recently that uh, in the constitution, our founders provided for patents and they said they're for securing the rights to inventors for their discoveries. And so it just it amazes me that they call them discoveries. So we're not creating something. This is something that the solution exists and my task, I was determined to find it. And so I just tried all different things. Um, eventually, I came up with uh, a technique that really, really solved the problem. Uh, so I had, I started with a single water balloon and I was thinking, how can I seal this without tying a knot? And so I thought I'll get a real small O-ring and I'll put it around the neck of the balloon. Maybe that'll clinch it shut. And I actually found that I, I, I got an O-ring I, I thought would work. I got around the balloon and then I set about trying to get the water in. So I got, I found a small tube and I inserted it through the neck of the balloon to spread open the, the O-ring. And at this point, I only had one balloon, one ring and one tube. And then I went to try to hook it up to the water 
And I had to, I had to come up with a, an adapter for that. And so I took the cap that goes on the end of a garden hole, hose and I put a hole in it and I proceeded to attach the tube to that hole. And that's when, that was one of the Eureka moments. I, I looked and I thought, well, that's a very lonely tube. I could put more. Right. <laughs> and so I didn't even, I didn't even test it. I went ahead and filled the end of that cap with holes. I ended up with 37 holes on like a two and a half millimeter spacing. And I put a tube in each one, epoxy them in, I took it out back and I filled it up and it was, it was like magic. The water went down all the tubes all at once. They expanded when they were full, I shook it and boom, they sealed. And at that point I had, you know, that was, that was about 20 seconds. And so I put three of these together, I'm doing a hundred water balloons in a minute. And I thought, I think I don't want to go back to the corporate world. I want to go put this on Kickstarter and see if I can make it, make it happen. You know, you know, uh, Josh, you hit just some key points there, right? Like everyone has ideas. And I always say, it's great. It's important to have ideas. But as you said, you have to make them a reality, right? So you started out with what you thought you could do better. And then I always find there's a paradigm shift. You started doing one and then you realize, well, look, I can, I, there's more space. I can fit more tubes. So you have that aha moment and then you, now you've come up with this product that has a hundred in a minute. It's just, and I try to tell everyone that I work with, like, it's great to have ideas, but if you don't move on them and, and you can't make them a reality. And like you said, I don't want to go back to corporate America. I worked in my whole life. Right. And, and you know what it's like. And my son always calls it, um, how does he put it? He's got a really nice job as a purchasing manager, but he calls it work slave. <laughs> Doesn't want to be a work slave. I said, well, then you need to make something a reality a lot of great ideas but until they become a reality like you did take it those next steps it's just a, it's just a great idea and i didn't cover all this but I, there were several other te techniques that i attempted and one thing that i think a lot of inventors would benefit from is um not settling for a, a solution a lot of times you're like you've got a solution that works but you could do better and so i i didn't stop i mean i was tinkering i had i had this idea of of using a, a latex tube, um, like surgical tubing, and I tied the knot, a knot in one end, and the other end I filled up with water, so I had like this giant sausage. And then I was looking for, uh, you know, a little clip I could go in and, and seal it off and create little sausages and then slice them into balloons. <laughs> and I had another one where I was putting, you know, I was putting objects in the balloon to plug the neck, so to just get rid of the tying. And I ended, I ended up coming with trying to come up with soft biodegradable plugs that, you know, you could, you could put in a balloon and ended up using many marshmallows at one point. And it actually, it worked. I mean, I was filling balloons without tying knots. Um, but I, it just, to me, it, I'm like, I, I didn't feel like it was done. And so I just kept looking for that uh, optimum solution. And as an inventor, you got to do that. Or like, even if you stop, usually someone's going to come along with an improvement or better technology. So you've always got to be thinking about uh, uh, knocking yourself off because you want to do it before someone else does. That's a really, really good point. And, uh, you know, and, and it is, it's taking it, you always have to think about the consumer too, right? You know, about, about making it retail. Like, you know, we talked to, um, we talked to, to Aaron last week at Scrub Daddy and he had this product that that when he sold his company, 3M didn't want it and he wasn't even sure what he had. But then when he realized what he had, his next comment was, I've got to make this where every family is, is every household has one and using it. So it's, it's taking it to that next level. And I, I think even for me, speaking for me, I always try to find a way when I do new products that it, it's, it's manufacturable, it's, it's, it's foolproof. So you're, you know, when a, when a consumer gets it, it's ready to go. There, there, there are no things they have to do. It, it's just, it, it's an easy process to use, much like you did with a bunch of balloons. I mean, you, you attach this now really to a garden hose, right? And you pop it when it's ready to go and it, it seals itself. And you got 100 well, balloons ready to go. Yeah, and even that was really interesting because a lot of people start, were asking, well, what do you do after you use it? You got to put the balloons back on? And, and it, it wasn't intuitive necessarily. To me, it was. I was like, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to replace tying a balloon with having to install these elast these O-rings. And so that was a, a big part of the challenge was, in fact, that became, uh, it, I didn't have a solution yet. 
uh, when I built my first prototype, it probably took me two hours, right? So I'm always thinking, how am I going to scale this? And if it takes, I basically, I came up with this, this tool in order to build my prototypes and, and a technique for, uh, you know, you have to expand this elastic ring by like 700%, which is almost the elastic limit. And then you've got to get it over the balloon and then let it shrink back down. And then there was material science challenges with uh, creep and permanent set of elastomers. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I had it worked out to where the best I thought I could do manually was going to take 30 minutes to make a pack of a hundred water balloons. And I'm thinking this has got to be a, a $10 product. Um, and so I'm doing the math, like to $10 product, that means you got to produce it for two to $3. Where does that half half an hour of labor go in? Just sending this offshore isn't going to solve the problem. And that's where uh, things got really interesting because um, after the after I put it on Kickstarter and it went it blew up, um, there was a lot of interest from manufacturers and retailers, and we're like, okay, well, how are we going to make millions of these, and how are we going to hit that price point? And so that so labor wasn't going to solve it. So I knew I needed an automated solution. Um, and so thinking through the mechanisms and the, the techniques and the capital that was going to take to build this automation. And so all those things are part of the problem that I felt as an inventor, most inventors don't go that far. And I, I think there's a lot of innovation that happens when you, when you think about scaling and, and, uh, economies and what, you know, if, if this thing costs $25, I'm going to sell a certain number. But if it costs six dollars, that's a whole that's a whole new world. Um, so right. working through those issues was was part of what I viewed as my job as an inventor and entrepreneur. Yeah. So Josh, let's talk about that for a second. So when you when you got this on Kickstarter, so you had you had a product that you you proof of concept, right? You had a product you felt good about. You put it on Kickstarter, and and, and I and I know the story. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that story. But it really did blow up. You were on NBC Today. It took off. So in your mind, what happened next? Because I'm guessing you didn't have this, this high volume automation where everybody wanted one now and you couldn't deliver type of scenario. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I had a phased plan. I, I, I think a lot of Kickstarter projects don't have a plan. <laughs> um, I, the, you know, the coolest cooler was, was running at the same time as my Kickstarter and they raised like $13 million but they, they totally flopped because they had no way to build this thing and deliver it. Um, they, they spent all their $13 million and then some. Um, so for me, I had, uh, I didn't just have a prototype. I had a pilot line uh, and it was just in, it's just in me. I'm like, I was in manufacturing. I felt like I want to take responsibility for s- s- identifying and addressing these problems early. So they're not surprises later. So I had a setup where I was able to, to manufacture um, my Kickstarter product. So I already had a plan to produce 2000 packs because I wanted to deliver my early backers that summer. I didn't want them getting it in the middle of the winter. Right. So I had a, a, a pilot line with, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the injection molding, the assembly equipment, the procedures where I knew I could crank out 2000 packs. And then, uh, I knew I could scale that to a certain point. And so eventually we sold like a hundred thousand packs on Kickstarter and then another hundred thousand on e-commerce after that. And we were able to just scale the manual process, the 30 minute process. That's the other thing we, we, we looked at, I built in that cost. And so at Kickstarter, we, we asked for $15 of uh, support in exchange for one pack of balloons. So I, you can see I built in some margin mm-hmm. didn't go out at $10 because I'd have been really cutting it close uh, with shipping. And, and in fact, we ended up, you know, we had to rework a huge batch of material because the, the first set of O-rings failed on us. Well, I had to eat all that cost of that materials. And I had enough to where I was able to deliver the 200,000 packs uh, using my phase one uh, process. And in parallel, we were working on the high volume process because by, by then we had demand for millions of packs And so we set about building the machinery to basically take the techniques and material science and build that into an automated process. 
So at that point, you had you already had in mind what you wanted to sell it, right? You figured it had to be below ten dollars, which I think is 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 a great price point. Now you've had quite a bit of marketing, right? You, you didn't you didn't physically go out and spend these TV campaigns, but you did a Kickstarter and you got a lot of press, a lot of good press, like you know, uh, um, you talked about N NBC and Today, and so you got some really good press, right? Uh, now, now what happens? Now you're yeah. selling. So let's talk about that. You start selling a lot. What happened? Uh, yeah. So it it like you said, it it went viral and uh, it was on you know like the blogs and 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 the web initially, and then it went on TV and I was on time uh, on the Today Show, and it was just unbelievable. Like it was way beyond what I imagined. Uh, would happen. I know. I know you've been on one of these shows. Yep. Uh, actually, Good Morning America actually covered this first, um, but they did, and they jumped right on it. But then Today Show thought we'll get the inventor out and do it, do a live show. So that was good. That, um, that's that's the, that's the best way to do it. I always find like if if I'm going on the show versus me now talking about my product, you just get you connect better. With, with, yeah. So that was a, that was another smart move on NBC to do that. Yeah, it was great. It really, it really worked well. I partnered with Zuru. It's a family-owned, family-owned toy company. Um, they're originally from New Zealand, and uh, but they do, they do a lot. Of, in this industry, it's it's just an economic reality that uh, you know most of this product has to be produced in in China and Asia, um, and so they. Uh, they have, but but they so they're not, but they're different. They're not. They don't rely on cheap labor, right? They rely on like high powered, high caliber engineering. So um, I had a plan with Kickstarter was going to kickstart, and then I had to go raise like ten million dollars, and it was going to take me three or three to five years to build this factory that that was required. I went and worked with uh, Zuru and they had a plan. They're like, no, we know how to automate, and they showed me some of their projects. And we built a factory almost fully automated in six months. Wow. Um, hey, hey, so, hey, hey, Josh, not to, not to cut you off real quick. Did yeah. um, and, and this is amazing how this happened because I would be overwhelmed that all these mm -hmm. things were happening at the same time. <laughs> Was Did Zuru um, approach you or did you know you said, man, I need help? And you went out looking for somebody to help you? Ah, great question. I, after, so Kickstarter flip the tables once, once, um, and that's a great thing about uh, crowdfunding and, um, well, crowdfunding especially is once they saw the, that there was uh, widespread demand for the product, I kind of checked some boxes off. They're like, yep, <laughs> we don't need it. You know, this product's going to sell. So people started coming to me. I, I heard from a lot, a lot of retailers, a lot of toy companies, uh, Zuru. I remember they hit me up on the, I think the second day wow. and, I lost track of it. Things were so crazy. Um, I didn't follow up. Plus, I was talking to Hasbro. You know, it's like, who's Zuru? <laughs> Two days later, I guess they emailed back, and it was like the third try. And I finally looked at what who this was and what they had to offer. And we had a call, and they they explained their automation strategy. And every other company, I, toy company I talked to would, would say, um, uh, oh yeah, we're going to make this. We're going to sell billions of them or millions of them. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do about the 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 manufacturing challenges? Oh well, we've got a factory in China. I'm like, okay, well, I've I've got that. What else you got? Yeah. Well, we've got a guy in China who can who can manage the factory and make make your product. I'm like, yeah, but what about the labor and the quality and all this? And that was it. And Zero came and said, well, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to automate it and and they explained the technology. Um, I actually went out and, and met with them three days after we finally touched base. And by the time I arrived, they had already designed the machinery wow. that was going to build this together. And it wasn't complete design, but it was like I, they had already identified the key challenges that I was aware of and had a, a solid engineering plan to solve them. Eventually, we built this machine. It's this big carousel and you feed parts in. So there's tubes that go in one bin, there's uh, um, uh, balloons that go in another bin, a vibrating bowl. And then the, the O-ring, that turned out really interesting. Uh, we were using O-rings and, and uh, compression molded O-rings and just vibrating them into the feeder. Wow. We ended up with, you can see in the, the graphic, we ended up using uh, uh, latex tubing 
And we fed the tubing into the machine and sliced it in real time to create the, the elastic ring. And then there's this equipment that, that just rotates around and picks up parts and inserts them, couples them together and it gets to the end and a robotic arm picks it off and places it on this conveyor belt. And it's like a dream, like my invention and early on it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week is just cranking down this factory line is almost as far as you can see. <laughs> it was unbelievable. We were making uh, tens of thousands of these a day. Um, we've now made, uh, We've made over 50 million packs of water balloons. Over 5 billion balloons have been produced using my invention. And this is key. I mean, the, the manufacturer, in fact, uh, that's, that's the reason I'm here today, which if we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the dark side of, of uh, knockoffs and patents and all that, because we were able to produce this product at a high quality uh, at a competitive price, we were able to survive the, the copycats. Yeah. Uh, like, and, I, and I'll Eric tell you, Josh, have been able to do that. I'll tell you, 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 you hit on a key point. Obviously, you know, manufacturing is my sweet spot, right? And, and that's photo here. I mean, it looks amazing, like a clean, lean, really efficient plant. But you made a decision. You didn't just someone, you know, it's easy to be flattered and someone offering you to partner up and then you get excited and you you do the deal, which ends up completely failing. You really know. did your due diligence. One of them, one of them offered me a million dollars. Yeah, I mean, there you go. See, I mean, I, I mean anybody, right? That's what I tell you before, and we'll talk about the back end of the story. But like, you have weathered the storm in more ways than one. I mean, making that decision early on that you're going to go with the right company, being flattered. I, I hear people say, "I got a licensing agreement." Okay, have you made any money? No, this person now can't produce it. So now you, you know, you now you're dead before you even started. Here you are, doing all this press, getting a lot of lot of attention, and you still were asking all the right questions to make sure you partner with the right group. And manufacturing, you said it, is 100% key to to launching a successful product, especially the one you have. It it was my baby. I wasn't gonna just. Uh, drop it off at the orphanage. I was <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hey, 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 Josh, real quick. So you're, this is happening so fast. It must be like, for me, it'd be overwhelming. You go to this place. It's like Willy Wonka factory to make your product. Are you just like sitting back going, waiting for the hammer to drop? Like, you know, what's going to happen? <laughs> Am yeah, I it, was, it was too good to be true. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and it, it did. Uh, <laughs> Before we even got to market, uh, this wait, this, that's not your product. Nope. This is the dark side. This oh here's God. here's a here's a guy that's that? worked his whole life, made something, right? Fought it to the end, got it in the market, sold hundred million uh, balloons, and now you've got somebody taking all of the work he did and copied it. So I'll let you go with that, Josh. Well, we were we were working on setting up our factory and, you know, preparing to fill our orders for the, the next summer. Uh, and so we, we did our Kickstarter deliveries and then, then we went and started to scale up and build this, this, this equipment line. Um, and then my wife gets a text from her friend. She says, I saw a copy of Josh's invention on TV. And I assured her that that wasn't possible. Um, it's probably some other balloon product. And she said, no, no, it's yours. And so I, I looked it up and, it was, it was a dead on copy of my invention. Mine was green and the one on TV was blue. So, so Josh, just for a moment, tell us that what, what you felt, right? You worked your whole life. You've got this thing launched. You got all this attention. You partnered with somebody. And now somebody, a friend tells you, you have somebody ripping you off, basically. What was your emotional state at that moment? Uh, I, was, I was stunned. I was stunned at the scale and the brazenness and the speed. So I expected Chinese knockoffs on Amazon and eBay. Mm -hmm. Sure. What got me was this was all over the TV and this was an American company. And I start looking into who's behind this. And I find out that this is their business model. And at that point, so at first I was sh shocked and bewildered. And then as I found out who was behind it, I was very afraid, very afraid for my future and for all my work. Um, 
I, classic though, right? Classic. The little guy does all the work. The big guy steals it. Classic. But yours took a different well, it's turn. It's good business, right? Because yeah. most inventors and entrepreneurs are going to fail. Like eight out of 10, nine out of 10. We do all the R&D, all the research, the trials, the, you know, you do, you launch a product and, and, and in a big box and it doesn't sell through and you still, you still, that's still a failure, right? Mm -hmm. And so these guys just sit back and like, they don't have to worry about all that expense and risk. They just wait for a successful product and then they van <laughs> there's no risk, no right. cost. Right. Uh, so a uh, company called Telebrands was behind this. Um, they created the as seen on TV industry or they created the logo. I don't know if they created, they were early on. Um, books have been written about these guys. They started in, they started in the eighties with knocking off Sony Walkmans and then Phi Master, Suzanne Summers was selling Phi Master. They'll, they're selling Phi Shaper. Every hot selling product, they've got a copy. So you go to the checkout, uh, you go to the checkout aisle, at, uh, big box, and you see all this essay on TV, the spin mop and the pocket hose and the pet egg. And um, most of those are knockoffs. Uh, that's, that's their business model. Um, I, you know, this is, uh, this is something they've been very successful at, made billions of dollars uh, copying products. I remember at the time, the pocket hose was a hot item. And I looked, I went to the store, I saw, I saw the inventor's product, the X hose, 1999. And next to it's the pocket hose were 999. It lasts three uses, but they sold millions of those and put the inventor out of business because he couldn't compete. You know, you know, it's funny. I, I, I know Michael. I know you do too. And the first time I met him, I said, "Hey, Brandy's got something she wants to tell you. The product is is horrible. It doesn't work." He said, "Chris, trust me, it's not my product. It's all the ripoffs, all the knockoffs." And then he went into explaining uh, the lawsuits he had. And then he sent me a couple. I, I, I'll tell you, what, I hooked those things up. I kept them outside, literally in New England, in the ice and the snow for two years, and didn't have one problem with it. So clearly, junk versus quality. In that case, but, you know, you know, Josh, most people, when someone rips them off like that, a big company, right? Like you said, fair sets in, you have no chance. They have big pockets, deep pockets. So what I admire about you so much, amongst other things, is that you felt that passion that you were not going to back down. You were going to fight this to the end and you did. And that's what I think is very different than many people. Like, Everyone wants to talk a good game. You you went through it. You did it. You fought it. So let's talk, let's hear about that a little bit. Well, I, I was I was very blessed. You know, I, I say that it, it was miraculous that I was able to survive against these guys. They've been in over a hundred lawsuits over intellectual property rights, and uh, they had never lost. They had never even been to trial, and so that's that's the really dark side of of. Uh, intellectual property and patents is they don't work the way we were taught and the way we believe it really comes down to all out scorched earth litigation. Um, these cases over disputes over patent rights, they take up to 10 years, sometimes more. I know a, a woman who's uh, a woman entrepreneur um, in the, uh, 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 printing industry, tra transfer printing industry. She's been in litigation over 15 years now against these big corporations. And it costs tens, tens of millions of dollars. And so their attitude is, if you can't beat us in court, then we can steal your technology. And it's very effective. Um, yeah. And, and, they, and like you said, they've been pretty successful. They haven't lost, right? <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, it's, so, it's a perfect it's a perfect business model until they met you let's talk about that yeah we so we went to court uh there's no patent police so if you copy a dvd or stream a video or you know you violate a copyright there can be criminal penalties um the fbi gets involved but not with patents and patents you got to go to court and we did in a big way <laughs> um and so here's the, so I'm just, we had so many, and so what they do is they file all these frivolous motions and appeals and um, they just assault you with their, their attorneys and their arguments. And, um, and so in our case, uh, kind of a classic, 
um, a classic tactic is, well, actually, normally you would think if you if someone accuses you of infringing their patent, they would argue that their technology is different, and so they don't infringe. Um, well, that that wasn't going to fly. Uh, so they went to plan B, which is to attack the patent itself. And so they can argue that the patent office made a mistake and you, you, don't, you don't deserve your patent, so they're not guilty. And so, um, and they filed like dozens of arguments and most of them were frivolous, um, but attacking the patent was, was a key tactic for them. So they argued in one case that no one knows when a balloon is substantially filled with water. And so my patent was too vague and so they're not guilty. Uh, another argument they pushed was it's obvious. You just combine a garden sprinkler with some plumbing fittings and like the surgical dietary balloon. You put those together and that's what, that's what Josh did. It's obvious. Um, and they're allowed to make these arguments. They hire MIT professors and pay them tens of thousands of dollars to lie through their teeth. And they go before the judges and usually this works. We were able to Fortunately, Zuru was a great partner and we hit them hard and fast and we've spent millions of dollars and uh, they lost on that argument and the judge told them they had to stop. Um, but that was just the first case. Uh, I remember at the moment I, I got the news, I called my wife and I was just, I had this, I couldn't believe it. I, I said, we won. It, it, we beat Telebrands. Um, and I was so, I, I didn't, I was so wrong. They came out three weeks later with, with another copy, they just made a slight tweak and we're able to start the whole process over again. So we're having to hire more attorneys and experts and um, we end up in this massive uh, legal war. And so you hear about the patent litigation like Samsung and Apple and Microsoft and these giant multinational corporations that you know they don't have a problem spending $50 million in court. They've, they've got billions or trillions, but it's the same system. This exact same system is used by small businesses um, and it doesn't work. Uh, we were very fortunate. We sold hundreds of millions of dollars globally. Uh, we've done almost half, we've done over half a billion dollars now in selling uh, a bunch of balloons. And so we were able to fund this, this massive legal war and keep these guys um, from, from swamping us. And then uh, key, key takeaway, um, th that wasn't enough. So um, in 2011, Congress passed the America Invents Act, and it was terrible for inventors. Like so many of these bills, it does the opposite of what they say. Um, the Trojan horse in that legislation was the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. So now, you know, the Patent Office for over two centuries would support inventors. You have to go through and apply. There's a rigorous examination. You have to pay these fees. They do prior art search and they usually reject your patent. And then if you get through it after two or three years, they give you a patent and it's, it's approved. Under this new law, uh, the patent office invalidates patents also. And so when a big corporation like Telebrands or Microsoft or Google or Apple uh, they want to use your technology, they just go to the patent office and pay a fee and they say they made a mistake. And so now there's 250 administrative patent judges and their job is to invalidate patents. And so what they do is they've been taught, Congress has said, and uh, big tech came in and set up the system and said, you know, patents aren't good. Patents inhibit innovation. Inventors, they're patent trolls. And so you need to get rid of these bad patents. And so they've now reviewed 3,000 patents and they invalidated 84% of them. And so that's the American Vents Act. Telebrands, wow. went to, Telebrands went to the, the PTAB and where they lost in a real court in front of a real judge, eventually a real jury, they were able to tell these guys the same thing. No one knows when a balloon is filled with water. It's obvious. And they took back my patent after all that. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, um, think about the roller coaster ride here. I mean, and, and let's just talk about that for a second. So you go from finding out someone stole your idea <clears throat> and you and essentially infringe on your patent to winning, becoming incredibly excited. We won. Can't believe it. To now 
going through all of the legal issues again, bringing you back to where you are now. What, I mean, what kind of, I, most people would not have even survived that. They would have never gone down that road. I can't, I, I think about it myself. I've been in some pretty heavy duty legal uh, confrontations with, with, uh, with, with Ford Motor Company and, and consumers and the, the, the intensity is unbearable, right? When you think about some of the stress levels. So I, I admire you for that for one, but man, the credibility you have for me to even think about that, that longevity and the path you took is incredible. So talk about that a little bit. But it, again, it's not for the weak. It's not for everyone. Not everybody. I don't think anyone in their right mind would take on somebody that strong, but with you believing in your product and seeing it and the passion, you know, I, I, it has a great ending, but talk about that a little bit. Well, it was a perfect, it was a perfect storm. Uh, most inventions aren't, aren't as valuable. And so it, what, you're going to spend 10 or $20 million, uh, give it to the attorneys. <laughs> um, so that's the thing is a perfect storm. The patent, the, the technology was so valuable and we were able to sell a lot of units. They were selling a lot of units. Um, and then, uh, and also for me, it was like, I'm never going to have another chance at this. I mean, I've had other inventions, but this one is, I mean, this is the one I got to, I got to make sure it, it pays. And so I ended up heavily involved in, in the legal world. I mean, I, I quit inventing. I quit I mean, we were, I was fortunate Zuru was doing a great job with production. So I was able to just, I was, I was reading briefs. I was writing briefs. I was telling the attorneys, Hey, isn't this unconstitutional? How can you have, how can you have a, an article three judge say one thing and then the executive branch comes in and overrules them. Isn't that separation of powers? What about the seventh amendment? Um, and, and it was interesting that we went through this period where, you know, my passion and my belief in justice and to some extent my intuition was pushing the envelope with, with the, the legal system. So the patent system has gotten so distorted that I was able to inject kind of a fresh view and say, wait a minute, how can this be? And before you know it, this, these things are going to the Supreme Court. Um, and so I was, I was just, I had to get heavily involved in, and because it was, it was the only, it was really the only game I had. Like I had done, put everything I had into this. If they take it away, I don't really have another, uh, another alternative. And so yeah, I went full uh, in. And I think about you now, right? You're now the resident expert. Like who would have thought that, right? You, you come up with this great, great invention. You get it to market. You got all kinds of attention. People love it. And now you find yourself. I mean, talk about the timeline, right? Five years later, you're in a legal, still a legal battle. And now you've become the expert in the field. Yeah. Well, you know, we had, we had this, yeah, this roller coaster. I mean, I thought we'd won. And then the patent office was stabbing me in the back. And uh, it just became clear that our legal system was utterly broken and that the law wasn't working. The procedures had failed. Uh, I... I, at this point, was desperate. I went to Washington um, and I went to Washington and, and called attention to what was going on. I was desperate. I took my family and joined some other inventors. That's when I met U.S. Inventor. Mm -hmm. U.S. Inventor is the leading, I'd say probably only voice for inventors in Washington, D.C., Wow. I know the UIA works closely with us on things, but uh, UIA is an educational mission, um, U.S. Inventors Policy Advocacy, and so we're a C4, uh, it's 501C4, for instance, and they helped me, and, you know, they explained how Congress works, the committees, and then they helped me at the patent office, We and this is not something that I, I was proud of, it wasn't a, a tactic, it was, it was actual desperation. The patent office was taking back my patents and they were, and these guys were getting away with it and it was looking really dark. Um, and so we went and we, we demonstrated and we called attention to it. We burned our patents. Um, like what, I mean, what else can we do? 
Well, I can imagine the, the anger, right? The, yeah, at this point, you had to be beyond frustrated to a point where now you're angry because nobody's listening to what's supposed to be a right to, and a privilege to be protected. Now it's it's no longer the case. I, could, I couldn't believe it. And it's still going on. The, the patent office is is working in concert with these huge corporations, and the revolving door and these bureaucrats that are not judges, they're pretend judges and they're making stuff up and they don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, they said, no one knows when a balloon is filled with water. Come on. That's um, the judges, the real judges at the, at, the, at the Court of Appeals actually laughed at their attorney when they made those arguments. But at this, at the PTAB, this makes sense to them. Um, so anyway, it's just total chaos. Um, what uh, what happened after this was um, I didn't I didn't know what would happen, but we, we actually got a new director at the patent office, <laughs> and then uh, you know a few weeks later I won an appeal uh, where where I, the patent office had invalidated my patent I got it back. Um, these this administrative judge who was wrecking everything they they demoted him and put a new judge on my case. Um, and this is not, I, I, this is, I can't believe this is what, how America works. I mean, I, I, this is not what I, I thought, but what happened was, and we can't, meanwhile, we kept paying the bills, $75,000 every week, dozens of attorneys, thousands of pages of filings. Um, and so between paying these bills and this PR campaign, I found that's how I got the leg up on telebrands. It's not because I had a great invention and a great patent attorney. It's because I had incredible wealth through the partnership with Zuru and the sales, and I had serious political influence. And turns out that's what the big corporations have, have been doing. They took our patent system that was tried and true and reliable for 200 years, and they came to Washington and they came to the patent office and they stole it. Hmm through power and influence and, and money. And I, you know, serendipitously discovered that formula. <laughs> and so Telerins is like, oh crap, this isn't working. For the first time in our history, he's, he's not going away. Um, the patents are, are, are coming back to life. <laughs> he's got these zombie patents that we can't get away from. They were spending tens of millions of dollars. They hired the biggest law firms in the world to try to crush me and it was failing. And, and I'm guessing, Josh, at some point, they probably tried to settle with you to get you out of the picture because now you're like that black gnat, that little fly that's buzzing around your head and you can't get rid of them, right? They can't get well, rid of you. No, they low, they made us some lowball offers. Um, they, didn't, they didn't come to grips with the truth until uh, we had a final judgment that they owed us thirty-one million dollars, so we were able to we were able to get a jury to decide in our favor, and they awarded us twelve million dollars. And then a year and a half later, we were still arguing in, in court, and the judge doubled it um, for the, for willfulness. And then they tacked he tacked on attorneys' fees. And so um, in March of two thousand nineteen, they had a thirty-one million dollar bill to pay. And it turns out that was the Goldilocks number. They had, uh, had they owed us a little less, they would have kept fighting, appeal. Amazing. Had they owed us a little more, they probably would have gone bankrupt, and relaunched. You know, you see Bulbhead everywhere now. That was, that was their plan B, was wow. just run away. Um, but then, so they had to come up with a bond. So I don't know if, uh, you might want to edit this out later. <laughs> <laughs> AJ Cabani was going to have to go sell one of his his vacation houses or his or his one of his private planes because he had to he had to deposit thirty one million dollars with the court. And so now he's like, am I going to do I want to dig my hole any deeper and fight this guy for another ten years? I'm going to pay the attorneys fifty million dollars just to try to get away with stealing this invention. And so they finally saw the light and they said, we better we better settle. Of course, then they want to then they want to vacate the judgment and have a confidential settlement. <laughs> I'm like, no, you 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 pushed it this far. 
you're paying the 31 million and you're gonna have to pay us for these other cases because they did this over and over again. Um, and so that's on the record, it's public. Um, they didn't get away with it this one time. Uh, but it's, again, it's not, yeah, I mean, I stuck it out and yeah, I was reading briefs and writing briefs till midnight every night for several years. And, um, but, you know, and the support of U.S. inventor, um, you know, God, God did some miracles and uh, we came out the other side and I, I want to use it for good now. And, and hopefully, I mean, this shouldn't be the way, <laughs> it shouldn't take this. I agree. It be I much agree. easier and simpler for inventors to succeed. Hey, hey, Josh, I know we only got a couple minutes left. Um, as an inventor, as all inventors that are listening in, um, one, how should they get involved? And two, where can they go to learn more about your story and also how to protect themselves? Is there a place right now? I know you guys are doing that, but it's amazing, this story. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, U.S. Inventor, some, some inventors there helped me out. And now I've joined. I'm a full-time volunteer supporting U.S. Inventor to give inventors a voice. And so, uh, again, we cooperate with all the inventor clubs and organizations because we want inventors to succeed, but we, we need, they need help from, from the government to, to stick to the deal. And if you do all the work and you get that patent, you need to be able to rely on it. So uh, usinventor.org, you can join and we need you to join. So this is a grassroots movement. So we can't compete with their high powered lobbyists and campaign contributions, but we can compete by getting educated and meeting with uh, congressmen and senators in each of the 50 states. And that's what we're doing. So we're building a grassroots, grassroots movement at US Inventor to educate and really empower and give inventors a voice. And uh, we're, we're, there's 325,000 inventors, patented inventors who, have, who are uh, part of a small business. And so we're growing the movement. We want all 300,000 inventors who are involved in small businesses to be a member. And so we're, we're well on our way. That's awesome. Well, I tell you, Carmine, this has a making. Uh, I mean, you know, what a, what a story when you think about it. I've, I've heard it a couple of times now, right? And every time Josh talks about it, I learn something new. Think about, I mean, what we, what we started out with in, this, in, in the early stage of this conversation, right? Finally got noticed. Great invention. The people in the market love it. He's getting national media attention and somebody rips them off. Yeah. And then you go through, like he said, the dark side. I mean, this, this really does have the makings of a movie, honestly. Right? This, this is something that everybody can relate to, uh, whether you have an invention or not. It's the little guy against the big guy, and the little guy did all the work. Right? Uh, what, what a story, Josh, I'll tell you. You know, there is, my hair, there, it gets is, better. There, is uh, there is a movie. Yeah. <laughs> So, you, you know, Invalidated is available on Amazon and it, it does a good job explaining what's going on. It would be very helpful for inventors to, to go into this eyes wide open. So to check out Invalidated, the shredding of the U.S. patent system. All right. Well, awesome. Josh, I can't thank you enough. I always enjoy talking to you. Uh, you know, we met. It's funny how we met. We met at Make 48, probably uh, almost seven years ago or so. But uh, I really appreciate you personally. And I, I, I know I tell you this all the time when I see you, but I mean it. Like um, for somebody to have that, that that drive and that passion to not not give up and not fold up, boy, I'm 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 a competitive guy, right? And I look at what you did, and I'm like thoroughly impressed. Like really saying to myself, that is that's a journey that that is not for the weak, and it's not even a journey for the strong when you think about it, and what you went through. So. High, high commend uh, remarks from me. I really, really appreciate you. And I know you do a lot for the community. You do a lot for inventors. And uh, I personally want to thank you. Yeah. Same here. Well, yeah, thank you for partnering with me. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So great, Josh. I mean, uh, not only have what you've done, but, but you and U.S. Inventor, the ripple effects going forward, um, really saving a lot of people. And it's just going to get better. I have the feeling you guys aren't going to give up. So it's just awesome. So for all you listeners out there, go on out.
see what's happening. U.S. inventors, join the UIA, join U.S. inventors, do what you can. Make sure that you're not only protecting yourself, but you're doing the right thing. Uh, we thank Josh Malone for coming on today. Hopefully we'll have him back on. I mean, we could have probably had a three hour segment here with so much information to pass along. And uh, that would have been pretty awesome. But uh, for Mr. Christopher Guerrero, for myself, thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time on Made in America. You all take care.